In two years, he, he majored in three disciplines, physics and math, forget it, and then philosophy as well. Two years later, he took an MS in theoretical physics at Purdue University, following which he climbed the Mat Matterhorn. He climbed the Matterhorn. He climbed the Matterhorn. This is like, this is the, this is Iron Man's resume, okay? And, and this is not Iron Man. And published extensively on mathematical topics relating to algebraic and differential topology, including the first theoretical solution to the re-entry problem for space flight. I'm gonna say that again. He came up, he worked on the, the first theoretical solution to the re-entry problem for space flight. Dr. Smith decided to forego a professional career in the fields of his primary interest, physics and philosophy, in favor of pure mathematics. Pure mathematics. And after taking his doctorate at Columbia University, he served as professor of mathematics at MIT. If you don't know what the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is, that is the holy grail of mathematics. Dr. Smith, you, you caught my interest because essentially you are saying that the foundations of physics the foundations of all that we can measure and how we explain the world are all wrong. Yes? In a way, yes. Uh, in the beginning of the 5th century BC, there was a Greek philosopher named Democritus, and he's really the father of atomism. There's a famous fragment that has come down from Democritus, which says something to the effect that uh, according to ordinary belief, there is color, the bitter and the sweet, but in reality only atoms and the void. Only atoms and the void. Well, uh, this uh, Democritian uh, tenet was very much attacked by Plato and his school, and for about 2,000 years, uh, it was uh, proscribed by the informed. The informed world recognized this as a heresy. But in the 17th century, in Europe, that very Democritian formula was rediscovered, so to speak. Uh, and proved. Uh, it was never proved because it is, uh, it is false. <laughs> it is a heresy today as it was in the days... So you're saying Plato was right? Plato was certainly right and Dem Democritus was certainly a heretic. And my point is that in the 17th century, that very, very ancient heresy was revived and became the basis of our modern Weltanschauung. Our modern Weltanschauung is based upon that very, very ancient heresy, which for 2,000 years was abandoned by the well-informed. There has been a misunderstanding in the worldview of modern humans. You see it all the time, where some university-type atheists attacks a religious or spiritual worldview as being from goat herders. They say this in order to make it seem dumb to believe that there is more than the physical world that we can perceive. However, the materialist worldview of the atheist is actually the more ancient worldview that has been consistently defeated over the millennia by people like Plato, Isaac Newton, Donald Hoffman, Nobel Prize winner David Gross, mathematician Nima Akhani Hamed, Chetan Prakash, and the guy at MIT who teaches math and climbs the Matterhorn, Dr. Wolfgang Smith. The list of philosophers, alchemists, scientists, and mathematicians who have disproved the materialist world theory of atheism over the years is long and distinguished. The other thing about atheism that the atheists themselves don't realize is that the foundation of the modern rise of the materialist worldview had its foundation in a core belief in the veracity of God, or 
the realness of God. It was the belief in a creator God that allowed the rise of the materialist worldview to begin with. Take a moment to let that sink in. The foundation of atheism, the thing that happened in human understanding, that evolved it into the worldview of materialism, which is the foundation of atheism. You, after all, wouldn't have atheists if people didn't believe in material atomism. And the thing that allowed all that to happen was what Descartes called the veracity of God. In other words, the fact that God exists and created the universe. It is at this point that Dr. Smith will laugh a bit to himself, and at which you can confirm the fact that modern atheism stands due to an incredible lack of scholarship. This is why you constantly see these types of people desperate to censor their opponents, because they know they cannot debate their ideas successfully. The guy that teaches math at MIT is going to say that the reason for atheism is because kids got dumbed down by going to college and were told lies by people in authority. Imagine that. The foundation of atheism, according to the guy that teaches at MIT, is number one, the existence, the fact that God exists and that kids got dumbed down by going to college. Imagine that. Young people who have a higher education in philosophy have been deformed. They have been taught on high authority to believe things that are simply not true. I'm completely happy with ancient Platonist philosophy, I think it was a correct philosophy, and all the confusion has come in in the 17th century when René Descartes uh, came up with his idea of bifurcation and he revived the oldest heresy in the world and that oldest heresy in the world became the prime metaphysical postulate of modern civilization. And so for 400 years, all the young people who have a higher education in philosophy have been deformed. They have been taught on high authority to believe things that are simply not true. Is this why so many academics, whether they're philosophers or physicists, are, are strong atheists? Yes, certainly. Once you buy into bifurcation, uh, you don't necessarily have to be become an atheist. Uh, René Descartes himself was very far from being an atheist. And you see... The, 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 That's the, ironic. The funny thing is that he invented this idea of bifurcation when he was isolating himself in the garden retreat. He's, I don't know how long he spent there in seclusion. And he finally came up with this idea of bifurcation. And then... After he had come up with the idea of bifurcation, he sort of scratched his head and said, how do I know that this is really true? And so he continued to meditate how he could prove or verify the truth of bifurcation. And the interesting thing is, there's only one argument that he came up with, and it was what he called the veracity of God. Now, uh, how he conceived the veracity of God as proving bifurcation is another subject <laughs> that I don't want to go into. I just find it amusing yeah. that this ancient heresy was justified by its inventor uh, on the basis of what the inventor called the veracity of God. Of God. Right. And this is what Whitehead called bifurcation. 
and Whitehead lectured in physics departments all over the world, uh, explaining that it is a false idea, that it is impossible, that it is metaphysically invalid. So Car the Cartesian model is invalid? Yes, the Cartesian philosophy is invalid. Okay. And in fact, uh, Whitehead went out of his way to uh, convince physicists that the result of this axiom has been what he called a complete model in our understanding of physics. And then he complained, but any attempt to uh, explain to physicists what this model is and why it is a model uh, uh, has fallen on deaf ears. Uh, Whitehead himself lectured in England and America for decades uh, trying to uh, uh, enable basically the physicists to, ex to understand this point. And he finally gave up and said, I cannot do it. Was that because he didn't have anything to replace it with? No, I think the reason is that the notion of what Whitehead calls bifurcation is so ingrained in the physics community that when you try to explain it to a physicist, the physicist can't get it. I mean, I, I myself have had that experience. Uh, if, if you try to explain to a physicist what bifurcation is, chances are overwhelming that he will not get the point. And, and the reason is that it is so ingrained in his thinking. It's an orthodoxy. That he thinks it's just the way things are. You know, I think most modern humans have been taught that materialism is just the way things are. Dr. Smith is right to call it an orthodoxy. It's something that cannot be challenged. Part of the dogma of scientism. Something that is accepted on blind faith. Once you can point out that the foundation of atheism relies upon a 5th century myth of atomistic materialism, it's easy to explain the blind faith structure required for belief in atheism. There is the atheist that uh, most people take away from so-called science. Uh, I'm very disturbed by the fact that our universities have been literally taken over by uh, people who have completely succumbed to the scientific outlook so that the poor young people who go to the university to learn something and to gain wisdom of various kinds are actually uh, subjected to a kind of brainwash. The existence of a subcorporeal realm is something that has been very well known by, by the great. Now, most of my atheist friends point out that atheism isn't a belief in anything. It's a lack of belief in God. The foundation for the lack of belief in God is built upon the lack of belief in anything beyond the material world that we see. This is where mathematics, linguistics, and laws of logic make that disbelief irrational. Today's biggest minds in technology, mathematics, and cognitive science have dispensed with the irrational belief in materialism. Do you think an AI can be conscious? I'm certainly willing to believe that consciousness is somehow the fundamental substrate and we're all just in the dream or the simulation or whatever. Yeah. I think it's interesting how much sort of the Silicon Valley religion of the simulation has gotten close to like Brahman and how little space there is between them, um, but from these very different directions. So like maybe that's what's going on. But if, if it is like physical reality as we 
understand it and all of the rules of the game are what we think they are, then then there's something, I still think it's something very strange. So there you have one of the world's top AI scientists saying that he's perfectly willing to believe that consciousness is fundamental reality and that we're all living in the dream. Wait a minute, what's that called? Oh yeah, Neoplatonism. And then he says that the religion of the Silicon Valley has become indistinguishable from Brahmin, which is basically the Hindu notion of ultimate reality, which includes consciousness pervading through not only matter, but multiple lives of the Hindu theory of reincarnation. That's how the modern scientists speak about what they're discovering. Donald Hoffman, the professor of cognitive science from the University of Irvine, says that the consciousnesses are out there and that AIs won't be newly created consciousnesses, but will interface with existing consciousnesses and become conscious via that method. For those among us who practice the faith of scientism, this other world is already an accepted reality to them. They just call it the quantum world. From the Christian perspective, these are the energies spoken by the word of God. What Jordan Peterson is always going on about the logos. Tolkien, a Christian himself, wrote that the material world of his universe was constructed by a song. A song being the word sang and expressed. Dr. Smith will go on to describe his theory of the solution to the hard problem of consciousness as vertical causality. That basically the thoughts and ideas come from the quantum realm and are actuated in the corporeal realm, that's here, through the secondary tellers of the universe, and that would be us. Now some people might be tired of hearing me talk about these philosophical concepts, and would rather carry on about sports ball or other parts of the bread and circus of our modern society. However, I know there is a large percentage of people who are searching for deeper meaning to life. This is it. What do you, where do you think is the origin of life then? Well, the origin of everything is in God. There's no question about that in every civilization. Uh, Every religion from the lowest to the highest uh, has, has recognized. Uh, and uh, I, I think we are reaching a point now where this basic recognition will again be discovered, so to speak, and it will, it will become the leading paradigm of human life once again. Uh, as I have mentioned before, I believe that the 400-year arc of history began with Galileo and Descartes is now reaching its end. And so this will be a rediscovery of the vertical dimension, which is uh, based upon God the Creator. I mean, the distinction between God and the universe defines, as it were, a vertical axis, the axis leaving, leading up Creator, up the God. And this discovery of the vertical dimension is what uh, is now drawing very near. A, a number of discoveries have been made which point in that direction. A number of people have expressed these ideas very, very clearly. And I think it is just a, a matter of time uh, before this uh, scientific Goliath will actually uh, uh, disintegrate. You know, there's a tremendous ideolo ideological pressure driving our our sciences. Um, you, you, any, anyone who thinks that there's freedom of the scientific world is, is sadly mistaken. Uh, the whole project is ideology driven. It is a kind of religion. I, I like to think of it as an anti-religion. It is a religion from below. And it is very aggressive and it is very intolerant. There's no freedom of speech. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I could tell you a lot of stories, but I won't because uh, we have better things to talk about. But uh, science is not what it is supposed to be, uh, rational inquiry in the nature of things. Uh, it, 
there is an ideology behind it. And in fact, uh, in the last century, this ideological factor and the pressures resulting from it have increased enormously to the point where actual mendacity has occurred. In other words, uh, there are results being uh, falsifications that are being suppressed. All sorts of things are happening in the uh, physical sciences, uh, which really shouldn't surprise anyone. Billions of dollars are involved, and um, the upper echelon of the scientific uh, the scientific leadership, has enormous social standing. I mean, they are the accepted gurus uh, of our society. And so it should not surprise anyone to, when I claim that actual mendacity has entered the picture here and there, and there. anything but a free, free society where everyone is able to express his views, uh, it's a kind of dictator. And, uh, but yeah, science has become, uh, well, it's Politicized. It's, it's a political weapon and it's become politicized and you're right things have been not told or told in certain ways that may not be what they really are and yeah it's difficult yeah you you mentioned the word i was groping for politicized that's exactly the right word it has been politicized and it is no longer uh, possible to assume that every journal article uh, has been properly vetted that Negative results have been reported, consequences drawn, etc. It is a kind of religion. I, I like to think of it as an anti-religion. It is a religion from below. Lingering on that point for a second, what is science? According to one of the world's top physicists, at one of the world's top universities, science is a religion, but like an anti-religion. A religion from below. There was once a time in my life where I was completely fooled by science. I had blind faith that science provided a system of internal checks and balances, and that turned out to be completely false. In the end, this isn't because there is anything wrong with science, it's because humans have political aims and even personal ambition that corrupts the process and leads to incorrect assumptions plagued by small sample sizes and overenthusiastic data interpretation. You know, and people always get tripped up here and ask, well, you know, if science is so bad, then how do we have all this technology? Technology has always been steadily progressing throughout history. Science didn't come along until after the Enlightenment, it would be completely irrational to link the two. They are separate. The editor of one of the oldest peer-reviewed journals in the world, The Lancet's Richard Horton, said in 2015 that the case against science is straightforward. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue, afflicted by studies with small sample sizes tiny effects, invalid exploratory analysis, and flagrant conflicts of interest, together with an obsession for pursuing fashionable trends of dubious importance. Science, Dr. Horton said, has taken a turn towards darkness. Okay, so... Let's trust the experts for a second here. And that's an appeal to authority, but let's never mind that that's a fallacy. Let's, let's use those who believe in science's own criteria, trusting the experts. I would understand science then to be a dark religion from below. How would you interpret that? The belief that testing can reveal true answers was always a leap of faith to begin with. And in fact, a few months ago, the Nobel Prize was given to three physicists who proved that local realism is false. Now, wait, does that mean that the universe is not real? No, 
It just means that there's more to it than you can see or experience. How hard is that to accept? For a modern human, nearly impossible. Whitehead complained about this a lot. When he tried to describe bifurcation to people, they couldn't get it. Why? Because they had accepted their scientific materialism as a core part of their faith and would not allow it to be challenged. In a lot of ways, the enthronement of quantum physics by the crown of the Nobel Prize has given scientific materialists a pass to dip their toes into this vertical dimension that Dr. Smith is speaking about. A materialist will shy away from statements like God or heaven, but will feel comfortable with the poetry of quantum physics and mathematical proofs, which will allow him or her to accept the same thing. Modern people don't like to use the words thank God anymore, and so they say thank the universe, or things like the universe wanted this or that for my life. I have a lot of friends who say it. What, a, what does the word universe mean? Uni means one. Verse, what's a verse? That's a song or poem composed of words. Wait a minute here. So you're telling me that the word universe means like the one word or the one logos? So, hold, number one, when they say universe bless you or something like that, they're still saying God bless. They just don't know it. But notice that the word universe itself is a puzzle. And now you know why Tolkien wrote that the universe was really a song. The one verse sung by the angels. Because that is literally what the word universe means. Welcome, my friends, to this journey where we will allow ourselves to actually comprehend things. I'm glad you could join me. I met the people that, you know, you call the Invisible College. They're all studying um, what they believe is the modern day, you know, encounter with non-human right. intelligence. The very people who are most immersed in the study of even the quote unquote technology um, are having uh, experiences that I would call religious-like experiences. And these, these are changing them and shifting them. They live really almost like monastic or ascetic lives. Um, so to not include that as data is probably, and well, let's just put it this way. I think it's interesting. I'm including it because that's what I see. Like how does, I don't know. How does that thing get here? <laughs> yeah, all I can tell you is how people have seen it for a long time, not just in the 21st and 20th centuries. It's been around. All of these people report all these similar experiences, even though they don't they don't understand what it is, but they describe it to you. Like for instance, the guy, Gray Man was his name. Yeah. He had a crazy experience with this being hovering above him at night and he described it to you. And you said what he described to you was to the T, uh, the Saint, Saint Michael, <laughs> yes. the archangel. Yeah, he didn't even know it. <laughs> so like that that was the point in reading your book where like I had to put it down and take a walk. <laughs> yeah. I agree. Even the history of the space program, the Russian and our space program, American space program, you know, we have founders who had really interesting experiences like Jack Parsons. Yeah. On the one hand, <clears throat> totally bizarre, you know, and most people would not want to talk about that especially if they're working for NASA or aerospace, you know, they're so not going to talk about that. Could you describe briefly to people who Jack Parsons was? Yeah. So, okay. So, um, there's a couple of people that are recognized as the father of rocketry. They basically created the calculations to get us into space, to get us out into space. And one of these people is Jack Parsons, probably the most uh, effective uh, 
Werner von Braun is one as well. Um, but he actually gave a lot of credit to Parsons and said, Parsons figured all of this out. And how did Parsons figure this out? Well, he had a really interesting way. He lived in the early 20th century and he was working on rocket technology, but he also was a friend of L. Ron Hubbard who started Scientology and Aleister Crowley. And he had this crazy life and he lived in Los Angeles and he would do rituals in the desert. And he thought that these kinds of things would help him basically download this rocket technology and it's weird but as weird is Konstantin Tchaikovsky on the Russian side he didn't have the same belief system as Parsons but believed that he was in contact with angelic presences who would also allow him to you know, create this rocket technology. So that's what I'm talking about, is like the people who are the most valuable to this program are the people that are doing the stuff that most people would have discounted because it's so weird. When you scratch the surface of the UAP UFO topic and you look at the people who are the most successful at, you know, mm, okay. um, moving the needle, um, you're going to find that their lives are imbued with this kind of mystical practice. Mm. And what, what is it about these people that they are able to do these quote unquote downloads that they talk about, that you talk about in your book? Like Tyler has this specific protocol that allows him to connect with, with nature and this network of nature. Yes. So um, a lot of the people, basically, they're fa even if they don't know they are, um, in my field, uh, we also study monastic traditions like you know there's a history of monastic traditions people who are monks and nuns and they tend to uh, live in communities with each other and work on their spiritual growth basically um, do things like pray a lot you know study a lot and so what i noticed about tyler was that he lived a fairly monastic life even though he would never know that or call it that but um, he had these these what i called protocols um, they were physical and spiritual and mental protocols. And what I noticed was that a lot of people who were doing the same kind of work followed these protocols. And they enabled them to download information that they were interested in. Um, they could be useful things like technologies um, or, you know, other things like artistic things, projects and things like that. And so when I finished American Cosmic and it, it was out there, a lot of people with this ability reached out to me and I met a lot of very incredibly successful people um, who were doing this their whole lives, doing this similar thing their whole lives. And so I interviewed them too, because <laughs> I wanted to know, you know, what, what's going on? What were they doing? Why are they doing this? And so what I figured out for the most part is that religions, different traditional religions were the traditions that held these technologies and now I see these protocols as like body technologies or you know technologies of connection and they would um, enable people to be super creative and help culture in many ways like Teresa of Avila is a doctor of the church she was able to do this she was a, a nun um, and a lot of the tradition in the Catholic tradition, the saints, they were doing the same thing. They were, you know, they had these practices that enabled them, they believed, to connect to their God. But that's just because we didn't have a global society. Now we have a global society and we can actually do analysis of what's going on when people are connecting. Harvard's done studies of people who meditate and how it changes, phys physiologically changes your brain structure. Right. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, so I think that this is if I were to say the one thing I learned most from my work so far into UFOs is I learned about these protocols and I met a lot of people who do them. And that's what I'm interested in right now is that because it seems to me that the other stuff is a huge distraction, because if we could just focus on this type of thing, it would, you know, where people, <laughs> you know, they're able to resist being distracted by media and you know focus on on what they what they actually are interested in you know what are you really interested mm -hmm. in instead of being um 
hung up on, you know, being distracted by stuff and consuming stuff and going on to the next thing because you're bored. Right. You know, so these people are never bored. There's this thing that creative people, um, specifically writers and painters, they talk about when they're trying to get into like a creative flow process of doing their work is when they just when they start when they start working on something, whether it be a poem or a piece of artwork, they they just start by picking up the brush and just like splattering paint everywhere. And then once they start to keep like once time passes, they start to like get into this flow. And some people like to call it the muse Mm -hmm. where this thing just sort of comes out of the ether and, and, and creativity and things just flow through you without thinking. That's right. That's it. That's the similar to what Tyler was talking about, where he has just thoughts that enter his brain that that yes. have nothing to do with with memory or anything he's ever learned. They're just ideas that come out of the ether. Yeah, yeah. So he's not he's not the only one. There's so many of peop of people. You know, there's so many people like that. So yes. Yeah, so um, to me, that's the most interesting thing. And I was um, and most and a lot of people were very interested in it. I mean, he's just talking about having. Okay, let's put it this way. In many traditions, your body is, religious traditions, your body is considered a temple. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, what is it a temple of? It's going to be a temple of God, (laughs) right? So it's a temple that, so this idea has been around for a while. We just forgot about it. And so it's being, you know, I'm looking at it and saying, hey, you know, this has been around for a while and these people are doing it to great effect. And it's basically making sure that you're, you're healthy and you keep your body, you know, um, if it is the case that we're transmitting and receiving information, that you're keeping it, your body clear enough and healthy enough to do that. Mm-hmm. So I think it's kind of like a human thing. I think a lot of people can do it. And during the time period, he was really open about his beliefs. And part of what he used to say was that there were a higher, there was a hierarchy of beings. And he placed God at the top, he was Christian. And then he placed angels below God. And then he placed um, beings, like off-planet beings. He called them off-planet beings. And then he placed, and this is where it gets really weird to me, factions in the intelligence community, and then normal humans. That was the, the okay. hierarchy. Okay. Was he, was Tyler religious before you guys, before you, like when you first met him, was he very a religious person? Um, he was religious in a pretty normal way. Okay. So he, he went to church maybe a couple times a year, um, non-denominational Christian. Obviously, when he met me, I taught him a lot about, Mm -hmm. you know, what I knew. And when we were at the Vatican, he experienced a pretty intense religious experience. And so now he's very religious, like Catholic, goes to church, works, I think, still. After his experience at the Vatican. Yeah, yeah. And that was nothing that I promoted or wanted to happen, by the way. It just kind of happened on its own. I was fascinated Mm -hmm. by it. Um, so yeah, so, um, no, he was not, he was not super religious. Okay. So God, God is at the top. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Angels are below that. Yeah. What in his view are angels? Well, he changed his view when we went to the Vatican and we learned a lot more about the saints and what was happening with them and their interfaces with what looks like similar to what people are saying when they have UFO experiences today. And he started to understand it from a broader perspective. And he thought perhaps that the things that he was studying had to do with angels. And so he was willing to decide that maybe the the category of angels and off-planet intelligence were closer than he had thought before. And maybe they were the same. And so he revised that, but he kept everything else the same. So he he combined angels and extraterrestrials? Yes. Well, remember, he's calling them off-planet beings. He's not calling them extraterrestrials. Okay. Is there a reason? Isn't that the same thing, though? Um, not to his mind. Because I think he's keeping an open mind as to what they are. He believes in them and interfaces with them, but he, he's keeping an open mind. So is, or, is, he did is the time. difference between off... When he says off-planet, does he mean like stellar is or is he talking like are we talking multiverse like different dimensions yeah so these are the questions that he had okay so he didn't know that's why he left it open i mean i think that he believed and 
that they're in space and that we encounter them, you know, in space. And oh, we encounter them in space. And they come down too to our atmosphere. So I think that he he calls them off planet. They're not terrestrial. So he claimed that we see these things in space. Um. Huh. The original title at the release of that concrete podcast was Top Aerospace Scientists Believe UFOs Are Biblical Angels. A few hours after it came out, they changed the title to what it is now. Top Aerospace Scientists Suspect UFOs Are Biblical Time Machines. Maybe they thought angels was a little bit on the nose. But it's a great talk about the current paradigm shift in science and technology as leading people in their fields begin to discover what Dr. Smith called the vertical dimension. Latakia Flake was a surprising experience, much more Virginia and Oriental rich than I was expecting, with the Latakia being more of a supporting player with the two other leaves there. The flavor is a real classic. Jim Inks gives it a four-star rating, and while I prefer the more dark Latakia offerings like Penzance, I felt that this offering would appeal to those who appreciate more of a squadron leader, standard mixture type blends. The flavoring was mostly natural. No big toppings here, but the leaf is nice and oily pressed like most blends that come out of the Germain's factory. I also wanted to give a shout out to the Markovich girls who were part of a collectible card ad campaign in 1932. You would get a photo of a different beauty here in each pack. This looks like to be the full set. Really interesting to look back and see the fashion and taste of beauty back then. Also a special shout out to Asiki and Pipes. They make really well engineered pipes. The presentation is incredible with the nice boxes and the laser etching on. But the really nice thing about them is they're designed for like weight balance. This is a pretty large sized bowl, but it's as light as a feather. Very well done as most of you know. I see these pipes everywhere these days. The professors we've heard from today are top people in their fields. They're not conspiracy theorists. They're department chair heads and universities, you know. And there are many others who share their view about how this world is just a bit more strange than we realized, but that we have a long history of religious tradition to help us comprehend the nature of reality. Personally, I don't really believe in aliens. I'm not a Gnostic. I'm much more simple than that. A fool like Percival. A fellow once said that you had to be like a child to see. Hopefully these coming revelations will help us look deeper inside of ourselves to find the strength of what we truly are and what we can become. God bless you all.